Welcome back to Murder Under the Midnight Sun. My apologies for the long delay between episodes. I've just been dealing with health crap, and of course the holidays are really good for hijacking a large part of December. As usual, this episode is brought to you by my lovely Patreon supporters. I just posted the newest Patreon episode today. It's about the murder of Bill Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth, a really bizarre case that took place in Tennessee in 2012. So if you would like to listen to that and other bonus episodes, check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Midnight Sun Murder. I've also added a couple of new tier options, so if you're interested, you can go check that out there as well. I like to send out goodies, extra stuff to patrons for different holidays, I did it for Halloween, and I've got some Christmas um, Alaskan-themed goodies that I'm going to be sending out to you guys. I have been too sick to go to the post office, but I will get it sent out as soon as possible, likely tomorrow. Sorry about the delay. I don't know about you guys, but I always like sort of wrapping up every year with kind of a list of the best and worst of the year for, you know, books, movies, that kind of thing. So that's basically what this episode is going to be. A bit of fluff, so if you're not in the mood for that, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you don't listen. But I just thought it would be fun. And of course, I would love to hear from you guys about your favorites in the categories I'm going to mention. And don't worry if you just need your true crime fix. I'm going to be getting some episodes out before the end of the year, I promise. So keep an eye out for those this weekend. Before I get into today's intellectually heavy episode, I wanted to run a promo for a new podcast hosted by one of my favorite internet people, who also happens to be the co-host, or I should say one of the many co-hosts, of mine on my horror movie podcast, Death Rattle. If you like meandering conversations about horror movie topics, give it a listen. However, her newest podcast, while it is in the movie genre, is a little bit different. Hi, I'm Lori. And I'm Steve. And we love movies. And each other. Ew. So we thought, why not start a podcast where we show each other our favorite movies? We call it The The Watch Pile. Pile. Yeah, because it turns out I haven't seen a ton of movies that you like. Well, how come you never saw The Goonies until we started dating? Oh, I'm sorry, but you've never seen Dr. Strangelove or anything on the Criterion Collection. Okay, mister, I've never seen Gremlins. Oh, what's scary when I was a kid. Whatever. On the watch pile, we'll explain why we've never seen these culturally significant films, watch them for the first time, and then we'll hang out and talk about them. And who knows, maybe we'll even watch some that we both love. The Birdcage. Event Horizon. Oh yeah, sign me up. So tune in and join us for The The Watch Watch Pile. Pile. So I hope that you will check out their new podcast. Sounds like a lot of fun. And for those fellow movie nerds out there, It's always nice to hear somebody else's take on a classic. So first off, I'm going to get into the category of movies. I don't claim to be a movie expert, and there are definitely whole genres that I rarely, if ever, watch. And it may surprise you, but I tend to gravitate more towards horror, mystery, thriller type movies, with the occasional documentary or sometimes romantic comedies. So for my favorite movies of the year, a large portion of them are horror slash thriller. And that's actually going to be a top six because this was a pretty great year for movies. So the first movie I'm going to get into is not a 
traditional feature length film, but it's actually a comedy special and it's called Manette. And it's a comedy special by a Tasmanian born woman named Hannah Gadsby. And it may seem like an odd choice, but it's a comedy special that starts out funny and then it gets pretty serious talking about some serious topics such as growing up as a gay woman in a place where that was more than frowned upon and just the horrible things that she had to go through in her younger years and how it's made her the person she is now. And I just thought it was incredible. I laughed and cried and just wanted to give her a hug and wanted to tell everyone I know to watch it. So if you haven't seen that, it's available on Netflix. The second movie I'm going to mention is a documentary called Three Identical Strangers. It was an extremely well-made documentary, and it's also discussing a story that seems like it should be more well-known, but it's something that was kind of seemingly kept under wraps for a long time. And it's basically about these three guys that in their adulthood come to find out that they are triplets. So they each grew up in, you know, their own house as a single child and had no idea that they had, you know, two brothers out there that were part of their triplethood and their adoptive parents didn't know either. And it starts out sort of heartwarming because they, you know, get to know each other and it's very sweet. But then you kind of get into the backstory of why this happened and it's crazy. It just takes you on all these twisted turns down a rabbit hole and it was truly an emotional roller coaster. I mean, I was crying dear certain parts and horrified by aspects of it. But I still recommend it because it was one of those movies that really makes you think. And I don't know, it's just such a great movie. And I haven't heard many people mention it, but it's available streaming out there. Um, I highly recommend it, especially if you like documentaries or like hearing about sort of weird, hidden conspiracy type things. It's hard to really describe without sort of ruining it, but check it out. The next movie I wanted to mention is called Revenge. And it's in a genre that I am not a fan of at all, which is the rape revenge genre, but it totally transcends it. And it's one of the most aesthetically beautiful movies that I've seen. And I think the acting and the setting really elevate the movie from that genre. So it's basically this girl that gets into some trouble with her boyfriend's friends while they're out at this remote house and she's going to be enacting revenge on them. It's a pretty simplistic plot, but the way it was shot was amazing and it was just a really incredible movie. It's definitely not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of gore and blood. So if you're not into that, don't watch this movie because it's all over the place. But if you like a good sort of fast-paced thriller type suspense movie, definitely give it a watch. But I must also warn you that it's in at least three, if not more, languages. So there are some subtitles, but they're not throughout the whole movie. So even if you don't normally watch foreign films, give it a chance anyways. It's also one of the best reviewed movies of the year, and it's currently sitting at 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. So it is critically acclaimed. Next, I wanted to mention another sort of thriller suspense 
kind of horror movie called What Keeps You Alive. And it's another very simple plot, kind of pretty similar to Revenge, actually. And it's a married couple that are both women, and they go out to a cabin to celebrate their one-year wedding anniversary. And without giving too much away, it turns into a life-or-death battle thing. And it's another movie that was really elevated by its aesthetics and acting. I think if there had been different actresses playing the main parts, it might not have worked as well, but they were both really good in their roles, and I hadn't actually seen either of them in a movie before, so it was kind of cool to find this indie movie that turns out to be incredible and had two very talented actresses in it that I'd never heard of. It's interesting because I looked up the director to see what else he had done, and he had done the Grave Encounters movies, which strikes me as funny because uh, they're just so different, far removed from this movie. This movie was, you know, completely serious and basically had me on the edge of my seat the whole time, while the Grave Encounters movies are found footage with, you know, night vision, camera work at like a abandoned mental hospital, and there's ghosts, and it's fun, but pretty silly and not exactly scary. So it's just interesting to see directors that have such diverse works. And probably the best movie I saw this year, this might shock you, was Hereditary. And I'm pretty sure you've probably heard about it. It's been all over the place. You know, people talking about, oh, it's the scariest movie of all time, which I wouldn't say that, but I thought it was a genius film. It's just, there's so many little things that happen in the first half of the movie that make sense in the last 30 minutes or so. That uh, it was just so well tied together. And the writer is fantastic. It's his first full length movie. And I'm totally looking forward to seeing what he comes out with next. I know that So many people have just been going on and on about this movie all year, so I will not. The last movie I'm going to mention is called Thoroughbreds. And it was kind of hard to classify this in a genre. I did see people mentioning it as a horror movie, which I would not, I would not go there at all. It's basically two girls played by Anya Taylor-Joy from The Witch and Olivia Cooke who was in uh, one of my favorite movies from a couple years ago called Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. And basically, they're both seniors in high school. And Olivia plays a character that is really socially awkward, not good with social cues. Um, She just kind of... somebody that probably would be called a freak in high school. And um, she's going to be getting tutored by... Anya's character, who is a, you know, rich girl. She's, you know, perfect looking, always perfectly dressed, totally got her shit together. And they end up forming a kind of weird bond. And eventually it gets to the point where it takes a darker turn and they're going to try to commit a certain crime. And it's really hard to say without totally ruining it but man the acting was amazing I just loved it even though it's kind of one of those slower indie movies I was totally sucked in on the edge of my seat just waiting to see what would happen it's also one of the last movies for uh, Anton Yelchin who I love him I miss him I wish he was still around to make more movies because he's such a great actor So if you miss him as well, this is another opportunity to see him uh, playing a really different role than he usually plays. So highly recommended. Highly. So those are my top six movies. And then I'm just going to give some brief honorary mentions to Monster Party, which is a reverse home invasion movie. Searching, which... I'm sure you've seen. It takes place all on a computer screen. It's a guy looking for his missing daughter. Fantastic. 
mom and dad, which is Nick Cage at his Nick Cageiest, basically parents, uh, something happens where instead of wanting to protect their children, all parents now want to kill their children. It was not exactly a horror movie, but it was, you know, pretty violent and also a lot of fun. And then lastly, Annihilation was incredible, just such an incredible film. Only reason it didn't make my top five or six is because it's just one of those movies I likely won't watch again, even though it is an amazing movie. And if you liked it as well, you should check out the director's first movie, Ex Machina, which such an amazing little sci-fi movie. That about wraps up my favorite movies of the year. There are definitely still some that I need to see. And of course, I would love recommendations. I'd love to hear from you guys what you loved this year. Just briefly on the disliked side of things, there was only two that really stuck out as movies I did not like at all. The first one was the only movie I saw in theaters this year, which was Halloween. I know that I'm betraying the horror diehards here, but I absolutely hated that movie. I almost walked out because it was just so bad. Um, and the other one is A Quiet Place. I know that a lot of people love that movie, but I thought it was just so full of cliches and it was just so basic, even though, you know, not being able to talk was an interesting premise, but I thought that the underlying plot was just predictable and lame. I'm sorry if you loved it. Next up, I'm going to get into the category of podcasts. And this is going to be my favorite podcast that started this year. So my old favorites, sorry, I love you, but only talking about the new ones right now. So the first one is called Behind the Bastards. It's hosted by Robert Evans, who previously uh, wrote for Crack.com, one of my all-time favorite websites. And I believe he also has worked as a journalist in um, wartime areas. But um, the podcast is, it tells the backstories of the very worst people in history. And it is amazing. The research is fantastic. Even if I don't think I'm going to like an episode because it's just not a topic I'm interested in, I end up being totally sucked in. Um. And it's a pretty wide variety of bastards that he discusses, you know, everyone from Hitler to Steven Seagal. Uh, and also, he covers both sides of the political spectrum. So just to keep it fair, because there's assholes on both sides. And, you know, if I had to recommend an episode to start with, I just had my mom check it out and told her to listen to the two-part episode on Steven Seagal because it's crazy blew my mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, every episode is fantastic. And he brings on guest hosts that are uh, other comedians, other podcast people. Um, he brings them in cold, they don't know what the topic is. And then he tells them all about this person. And it's fantastic. It quickly went from being a show I was just checking out to one that I get excited about when I see a new episode drop. So give it a shot. Let me know what you think. Next up is a podcast that started at the very end of last year, which is cheating a little, but it started in like the last week of November 2017. And it is the Omnibus podcast. It's hosted by Ken Jennings and John Roderick, who is a musician I had never heard of, but is actually from my hometown. So he talks about Alaska quite a bit. And basically, they're telling forgotten stories from history. And it's really fascinating. They're both crazy smart, really quick-witted, constantly, you know, throwing out zingers and one-liners. And it's just a lot of fun to listen to. It might take them like an hour to get to the point, but it's really good road trip podcast. Um, something to listen to when, you know, you don't really want to give your full attention to it because there's lots of tangents and stuff, but it's just a ton of fun. They are really cool guys. They seem like really genuinely nice and they seem that they have a real genuine friendship. 
So it's really enjoyable to listen to. Next up is a true crime podcast that is much different than many already out there called Swindled. And it's basically stories about con artists and grifters from the smallest to the biggest all throughout history. And it's a lot of stories that I have never heard of. So it's informative, but also really entertaining. And there's very little murder. So it's definitely in a totally different category from a lot of the popular true crime shows. And while he does cover the occasional, like, pretty well-known story, like Bud Dwyer, he has plenty that are lesser-known cases, so there's probably something new there for you to listen to. Next up is a podcast called Endless Thread, and it's about stories from Reddit. I don't know if you're a Redditor, but I'm a long-term Redditor. Um, I used to spend a ton of time on there, but not so much anymore. But... The thing about Reddit is that it's a really cool place to connect with people that have your very specific interests or your esoteric beliefs, and it's just a great place to make connections. So basically, these hosts go out and they find stories of interesting things that have happened through Reddit because of Reddit, and they find people involved in the stories and interview them, and it's extremely entertaining. It can be really heartwarming, and it's funny. One of my favorite episodes was the story about this girl that was getting ready to catch a plane, I believe in Tokyo, and she realized that she had left her passport and wallet in her hotel that was several hours away. And she was really worried she was going to miss her plane, so she posted about it on a Reddit sub-forum, and she actually found a guy that was somewhere closer to where her passport was and he actually took a train to the hotel picked up her stuff and brought it to her at the airport he was a total stranger and he just did all of this long day of travel just to help out a stranger it was a really fun story and I also heard one recently probably my favorite episode so far um every year reddit does a secret santa which I've participated probably five or six times and it's basically Hundreds of thousands of people participate, and including celebrities like Bill Gates, and you send one person a gift and you get a gift from somebody else. You have no idea who you're going to be matched with, um, and you give a little bit of information about yourself uh, for your person to shop for you. This year, I got an amazing art book. It's The Art of Horror. It was a fantastic gift. It was perfect for me. But the story I was going to tell you about was this couple that lived in two different countries and one of them had been the gift buyer for the other one. And because of that, they ended up chatting and then they ended up falling in love and they ended up uh, moving to live together. And it was all through this secret Santa thing set up by a stranger. And it was a wonderful story. Made me, made my heart warm or something. But yeah, there's a ton of episodes there, you know, all across the spectrum of stories, and you should definitely give it a listen, even if you're not a Redditor. And now for a couple of new true crime podcasts that I discovered and fell in love with this year. The first one is called One Eye Open. It is amazing. It's hosted by a girl named Steffi from the UK, and her father was a homicide detective. So she's got, you know, a close connection with that kind of thing. And she starts every episode with a personal story that ties into the episode. And she is just such a great host. She's got a wonderful voice, much better than mine, much cooler accent too. And while she just started this summer, she's already covered a ton of stories that I had never heard of at all. And Even when she has covered stories that I know all about, I still tend to listen because I want to hear her specific take. So that's high praise. And the last new podcast I'm going to mention is called Obscura. It is a true crime podcast started in May. It's hosted by a single male host, 
and the writing is really excellent and the hosting is great as well, but I'm having a hard time sort of explaining why I like it so much. He, you know, covers really well-known stories and some more obscure stories, but there's just something about it that I really enjoy, but I can't quite explain it. So if you like the show or if you check it out and end up liking it, maybe you can explain it a little better because I'm having a hard time using my words. I think I tend to prefer non-comedy true crime podcasts that are hosted by a single host, which is why I did my own show that way. So I guess I'm just naturally drawn to podcasts like that. So that's possibly an explanation, but I'm honestly not sure. But much love to all of those new podcasts that I've fallen in love with this year. Super excited every time I come across another podcast that I can binge. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come out with in 2019. And also looking forward to finding new podcasts to fall in love with. Lastly, I'm going to discuss my favorite books of the year. I don't really watch much TV or listen to much music, to be honest. Podcasts kind of replaced music entirely for me, so I just don't have anything to say about either of those categories. I am, however, a huge reader. I love books. This year, I set out to read 75 books, and I think I just finished 76 or 77, so pretty rad, but it also means I don't have a life because I spend a lot of time laying around reading. But you know what? In Alaska in the winter, it's either drink a bunch or lay in bed and read a bunch. So I think I'm doing it slightly healthier. I don't know. So I just wanted to briefly discuss slash recommend my favorite books that came out this year. And again, no surprises, I tend to read mostly mystery, thriller, suspense. Less horror than I watch, actually, because it's just not a genre that's very full of amazing writers other than Stephen King um, and the occasional nonfiction. But yeah, mostly, mostly mysteries. And you know what? I'm actually going to mention some books that didn't even come out this year. So I'm just like throwing all the rules down the toilet. But first off was the first book I read this year. I think I read it whatever day it came out in January. And it's called The Chalk Man by C.J. Tudor. And it's this writer's first book, and it had a major Stephen King vibe. You can tell reading it that he's a fan, and it reminded me quite a bit of It. I think it may have been slightly inspired by it, but it goes in a completely different direction. And it's basically this group of friends that it's 2016, and something happens that sort of brings them back to thinking about a crime that took place in the mid 80s when they were kids. So definite it vibes, but a lot more realistic doesn't really go the whole supernatural route. I loved it. It was amazing. I couldn't put it down. So I definitely recommend it to those of you that like mysteries, like creepy books, etc. It was a really fun read. Next book I'm going to mention is one of those that did not come out this year, but I did read it for this podcast. And I mentioned it on the podcast already, but here we go again. It's called Denali's Howl, and it was written by Andy Hall. And it's the story of the tragedy on Denali in 1967 when several young climbers lost their life. It was such an incredible book. It totally ripped my heart out. The writing was fantastic. The research was amazing. And I used it to cover that case on this podcast. And it's still the favorite episode I think I've ever done. So if you like survival stories, that kind of thing, I have a soft spot for those. Check it out. It came out a couple years ago, so you should be able to find it pretty much anywhere. Next up is another mystery that came out this year. It's called The Word is Murder by Anthony Horowitz. And it's a totally unique take on the mystery genre. It's, I guess you could call it a meta mystery, where the writer has written himself into the story as a character 
of himself. And he actually discusses several real life events that happened in his life that are interspersed amongst the fictional mystery of the story. Kind of sounds hard to explain, but it makes a lot more sense when you read it. And it was so funny and major page turner, couldn't put it down. And I kept having to pause and like look stuff up to see, okay, is this a fictional movie? Is this a real movie? Is this a fictional actor, actress, etc.? Because, you know, fact and fiction totally mingle. And he just did it really brilliantly. I have never read any other mysteries um, that are similar. And I know that he has a couple other books already out. So I'm going to just like tear through those um, as soon as I can. Next up is a true crime book that came out in 2016. I actually read it for another podcast I was writing for called the Dark and Stormy Podcast. And the book is called The Midnight Assassin. It is about a serial killer that terrorized Austin, Texas in the late 1800s. And it was a series of crimes that were never solved and were very similar to Jack the Ripper to the point where some people considered that they may have been perpetuated by the same person, which I don't necessarily agree with because I just don't because of the specifics of the crimes. Um, But it's an interesting theory and the writing is so good. The um, guy that put it together basically did years upon years of research. His name's Skip Hollinsworth. He also writes for Texas Monthly. And he basically put together this whole narrative that didn't really exist until he pieced it together through tons of newspapers from the era. So I can't even imagine how much work went into it. And it is such a good read. I normally am not like a big fan of unsolved murder cases, I guess, because I like I like a conclusion. But man... It was phenomenal. One of the best true crime books I've ever read. Probably top five. So if you love a good true crime book as much as I do, it's called The Midnight Assassin by Skip Hollinsworth. Get it. Next up is another mystery that came out this year, and it's called In Her Bones by Kate Moretti. This writer has released, I think, three books so far, and she's already you know, high up on my list of favorites. She's just so talented and her books are all so unique and unpredictable. And the basic premise of the book is there's a woman and she's the adult child of a female serial killer. And in her adult life, she's become obsessed with the families of her mom's victims. And she's kind of, you know follows them on social media, pays attention to what they're doing with their lives. And then, you know, a murder happens. And of course, you know, it turns into a mystery, but it's just so well written. And you have absolutely no idea where the plot's going to go. And her characters are so realistic, which I think is one of the worst parts about a lot of mystery books is that the characters are just you know, caricatures, basically. (laughs) They're never realistic. But she's incredible at writing realistic characters and realistic dialogue. So if you like mysteries, definitely check her out, Kate Moretti. This is her third book, and it's probably the best, in my opinion, so far. Next up is another mystery that came out this year. It's called Force of Nature by Jane Harper. I don't usually read detective series because I don't like constant like references to other books. I don't like having to like read every book in a series to like know what they're talking about. And I just like a conclusion. Usually I don't want to read about the same character over and over again, but this is one of the rare exceptions. This is the second in a detective series that takes place in Australia, which I have an obsession with. And The basic premise of this book is five women are on a corporate bonding type retreat and one of them goes missing and they're, you know, camping out in the bush 
So this detective has to, you know, try to find her and figure out what happened. And Jane Harper is another one of those writers that, like, really makes you care about the characters. You want to see what happens to them just as much as you want to know what happened with the mystery. Which I find that those writers are very few and far between. Plus the backdrop of, you know, taking place in remote parts of Australia is totally unique. I think that a lot of mysteries take place in big cities like LA and New York. But this choice of setting, you know, allows for totally different kinds of stories and, you know, kind of also gives the reader a look into a, you know, totally different kind of life if you're not from rural Australia. The next book is a another de debut novel, and it's called Sadie by Courtney Summers. And it's cool because I find that uh, there's been a lot of mysteries lately that, you know, put podcasts as part of their plot. And this does it really well. It's basically this girl, her younger sister is murdered, and she's, you know, trying to take revenge on the person that she thinks did it. And there's a podcast that is covering her disappearance after she's gone off to do this uh, revenge. So it takes place in, you know, a couple different timelines. And damn, it was a page turner. I totally plowed through it because I just had to know what happened. And it's another one that the characters are just so realistic and you know you could picture them you know somebody like this and I just you know couldn't get through the book fast enough because uh, I felt so invested in the characters. It also had a fantastic ending that I did not see coming but was so satisfying. Um, it's also a New York Times bestseller and even though it just came out in September it's already got like 12,000 reviews on Goodreads for an average score of 4.25. Also, earlier when I called it a debut, I misspoke. It is not a debut, but it's fantastic. I also, apparently it's considered a young adult novel, but it felt very adult to me, so don't let that put you off. The last book I'm going to mention is the newest book by my absolutely favorite mystery writer, The Witch Elm by Tana French. I know that if you know me at all, I've probably gone on and on about my deep love for Tana French's writing because she is superb, so far above the competition, it's not even funny. And her newest book is the first of hers that doesn't involve the Dublin murder squad. It actually involves a bunch of non-police people. Uh, basically, they find a skull and you know parts of a skeleton in this tree in the backyard of this house that they spent a ton of time in as teenagers and they're trying to figure out who it belongs to how it got there who killed this person etc yet again it's another book that's totally elevated above its sort of simplistic plot by the fantastic writing especially in regards to the characters and their interactions, and their dialogue. It was a really enthralling read. Uh, another book I couldn't put down. I have said that a lot already. But yeah, when I get into a book, I'm just going to fucking stay up all night and read it until it's dead. And that's what I did with this one. Um, it wasn't my favorite by her, but, you know, pretty much even the worst Tana French book is going to be streets ahead of the competition. So yeah, if you haven't read anything by her and you have even the remotest passing interest in mystery, do check her out. Start with her first book. It's not like a traditional series, but it's probably best to go in order anyways. And that is going to wrap up this fluffy bit of uh, end of year wrap up. I would love to hear from you guys what your favorites of the year were. Do you have any book recommendations for me? Because I'm always looking for them. I hope you guys are having wonderful holidays. You know, don't drink and drive, blah, blah, blah. Hope you have fun plans for New Year's Eve, etc. 
And if you like horror movies, my horror podcast, Death Rattle, we will be discussing our favorite horror movies of the year, which most of which I've already discussed here, but you know, my homies are going to have other stuff to talk about. So if you like horror, give it a listen. That will likely come out New Year's Eve, possibly New Year's Day. Thank you for listening. And as I said at the top of the show, I will be getting some episodes out to you guys before this year is through. So keep an eye out for those and I will see you then.